Why do artists do what they do? What are they hoping for? I was privileged to see for myself how these questions might be answered. On Thursday, I was at the Stanek Gallery, filming the work of the Seven exhibition and waiting for the artists to arrive. A young woman came in and after looking carefully at the whole show, planted herself in front of a large painting by Mary Spinelli. Mary, how does it feel to walk into an art gallery and see a red dot? It's marvelous. It's wonderful. Best thing that has happened to me in a long time. <laughs> that woman just loves your work. I'm thrilled about it. I really am. It's, it's great. I've always worked out of the bedroom in our home. Oh. I've never had a studio separate in another building. Yeah, yeah. I've gotten used to it now. If somebody said you could have a great big cavernous studio away from your home, I wouldn't, no. I'd say no. Yeah. I'm fine really the way it is. Yeah, I love that even more. <laughs> You said you paint in a very small studio, yes. but how do you do a big one like that? I work on quite a large table for all my pieces because I like a hard surface. Everything is on four-ply rag board that I've gessoed. I will go from the table, flat, hard surface, up to a wall sporadically to work on it, and then I can step back from it and look at it and make changes, but then it goes right back to the table. And when I get that large, the 40 by 60s, it's a little difficult. Your paintings always seem to me to be of places, but sometimes the places are of another world. Everybody says that, and I love hearing that because that's inspiring to me to look at skies or anything from nature. Aside from the work itself inspiring me, I love sunsets, clouds, everything like that. Hi, I'm Bruce Samuelson, now participating in a show at the Gastanic Gallery. I asked Bruce about how he connected with the gallery, and Catherine Stanek chimed in. We were doing our first exhibition called Inspirations, and it was about the people who inspired our work, and you're among them. That's how we came and invited you for the first time. So how did you inspire? Are you some kind of a teacher or something? No, I teach at the Academy for, for about the past 43 years. Uh, but Catherine Stanek was one of my favorite students. Inspiration goes both ways. You're a painter, and she's a sculptor. Well, I'm a frustrated sculptor. Oh. <laughs> I almost went into sculpture at the Academy in the beginning. It's interesting you said that because your paintings are very three-dimensional, the forms at least. Well, I look at sculpture just as much, if not more than painting, for inspiration. Michelangelo, Rodin, Giacometti, and Henry Moore. The way the forms in your paintings meld into each other, they're very atmospheric. How did you develop that style? I was a student at the Academy and couldn't see the model. Out of frustration, I found a corner of one of the other studios where no one was and invented my own figure. And I presented that for a crit to my mentor, Hobson Pittman, and he sort of freaked out on it and inspired me to continue investigating through my imagination. I continued to work from the model in the classroom, but I always found time to explore making up the figures and seeing where they would take me. And yet there are references to pretty accurate anatomy in your paintings. Well, for years, I always drew quite heavily from the model for pleasure. The answers were always in front of me, but it built my vocabulary. But it, I began not using any of those drawings for the work itself. It was just to build a, a, a reservoir of information. I might be inspired by a work of art, but usually I work pretty much out of chaos. I begin really with a mess until it suggests something to me. And you live in Bethlehem. Were you born in a manger? Yes, I was. Dan Miller refers to me as the star of Bethlehem. <laughs> <laughs>
I painted that block many, many times, day, night. I also use photos, but I prefer to work from life. So when I paint cityscapes, I need to see the scene as much as possible. So I stand in front of it for so long and I make drawings. It's a combination of memory, drawings and some pictures, very bad ones with my iPhone. I'm focused, I'm blurry. Pastel, oil, what are they? Mixed media. At least 90% oil and then there are some wax pastels, some pencils. Yeah, that's it. Do you prefer New York to Rome? I came here 20 years ago, so it's not, it's not about choosing, it's, it's just I live here. So I was living in Rome for sure, I was painting Rome. But Rome is difficult to paint, it's full of curves. Uh, the, the beauty of New York and American cities is that everything is like square and very geometrical. That stirs me on for paintings, for images, very much. You seem to like to paint stuff that's not picturesque. I would like to avoid postcards, feelings. So if I go to Rome, I'm not going to paint the Colosseum. Same, same thing here, I'm not going to paint the, I don't know, Empire State Building. So I prefer to, to paint things that are really related with my, my intimacy. There were two artists in the show whose words I did not get to record. Francis DeFranzo was at his home in California. His paintings of structures in strange and empty spaces are beautiful, mysterious, and painstakingly crafted. He combines different media. His large ones are often oil over watercolor and gouache on panel. Though intensely realistic looking, there is something almost dreamlike about his vision. We see a train seemingly halted in the middle of nowhere, and then there are two pictures where the subject is immersed in black. There is a humble shanty in blue. What is its function? Have its people long gone? And a boat stuck in black water, reflecting itself into a deeper enigma. These are paintings that really stick with a person. One artist would talk to me, but not on film. Fortunately, I did get his lovely wife to introduce him, so that at least you can get a sense of the mellifluous way in which he speaks. Excuse me, sir, what's your name? <laughs> I am Valerio Dospina. <laughs> he told me he obsessively takes and collects photographs. Valerio based this painting on an archival photograph of the Titanic and another ocean liner under construction. This painting of a factory is from the southern Italian town in which he was born. I learned that Valerio has a major fear of heights. He told me that this painting is a view from the top of the Empire State Building. He gets friends to surround him up there and take photos for him. He said he'd be afraid that sticking his arms straight out with a camera, they might fall off and hit someone on the ground. His tonal paintings of New York and other urban areas are alive with dynamism. I love the energy and movement in his art. My name is Julia Levitina. I'm a sculptor. I'm very proud to say that I managed to put a couple of new works in, as well as an addition of a work cast in something called Cast Stone. Typically I'm a bronze caster, but I'm currently working in a very large commission for Georgetown University that's taken up most of my time. But I want to experiment with this material that looks like terracotta. And I love terracotta, how warm it is, how it speaks to tradition, 
However, it's very fragile. I found this material called cast stone. It has a terracotta pigment mixed in it. I picked it mainly for its color, and then I really like the idea of having terracotta looking piece. I'm gonna have more pieces in that material for as long as I can stretch it out because it's no longer made. What draws you to the human figure? That seems to be your main subject. Human figure, something recognizable, something we can relate to, the way we relate to each other on a very intuitive level. I think we share our humanity and we share our appreciation of beauty that I think we feel was our bodies and beings. Appreciation of art goes all the way back to prehistoric times and people were moved by it. And, and I was just listening to a thing on NPR. It was an interview with a cellist who was playing in war-torn Iraq. Brahms fourth symphony and they talked to him about why he was doing it and he had this really th neat thing that he said he was saying you know what's really certain in the world we make these plans we think we're in control but at the end of the day everything is so uncertain and the only thing that has certainty is this appreciation of beauty and to me I always think that art is the highest form of hope I'm Mo Brooker. Bruce and I were talking about we are now considered the oldies because we were in school together and we considered ourselves to be young. Well, in my book, the great Mo Brooker is eternally young. I can take a texture that I find in nature, use it in a different capacity, like grass, and it becomes something else entirely. Nature always matters to me, continually. Some time ago, I asked myself the question, what reality am I in at any given point? Am I in the reality of my parents, my father was a minister? Am I in the reality of my brother who was a jazz musician? Am I in the reality of myself who was the youngest of seven? I am a seventh son. And I was the only artist who remained. My brothers could draw better than me, but they all gave it up. So that begins to represent for me dealing with the realities that I have come through in my life to arrive where I am today. The cube. I did some stained glass windows for a building in Long Island. 13 windows, each window 5 by 7 feet. If I were to get another project, what would I do? And I said, I'd like to do a cube. Can you imagine each of those 8 feet square? 6. And each one is flow glass or stained glass and inside is a light that comes on from time to time and then goes out. One day I'm going to get that project and I'm going to do it. I draw my hands all the time because I want the sense of the spiritualness that art is about. One of the reasons I find difficulty with art today, there's no spiritual sense. I don't mean church. There's a spiritual human sense and when artists speak to that, they speak to people. He's right. Art spiritually connects us to our past, our dreams, what we most love. It connects us to the beauty that Julius Cellist gives to the suffering, the friends who keep our arms from falling off when we perch on tall buildings, the places we live or remember or dream of. The woman who bought your painting was talking so emotionally about her childhood memories of this place in Virginia, I think it was, that her grandparents lived and the sunsets there and how it evoked that so perfectly in her mind. And it was very strong. I mean, I got that from this young lady. She was very sincere about it and it was very moving for me because when you leave the solitude of your studio after you've worked by yourself for so long and you go out into the world with the piece and people respond to it especially that way for me it's very moving